We are live. Hello and welcome to 2006, the Butterfly Effect 2 Review and Thoughts. This is a direct-to-DVD movie. What time is it? Wrong answer, fuckbag. This is the very moment of your reckoning. In the next 30 seconds, I'm going to start talking about one of two Butterfly Effect sequels. The first of these three movies is a well-made, three-edgy-five-me soap opera that I continue to have a soft spot for, yes, even though it at times feel like, feels like it was written by a 13-year-old for other 13-year-olds. The second one, let's just say it was watched closely by me. Sound okay to you, viewer? Listen closely, fuckbag. They screwed it up with the second one. Like it or not, the first movie's idea had serious balls, and for this one, they castrated it. This is the butterfly effect, too busy sucking to come up with a different idea than just doing the first movie again. You know, like all good sequels don't. Because it made money the first time, who cares that it's no longer fresh and original, and it's nowhere near as well made. Before I get further into it, brief off-topic, Anthony Vincent just released Eminem Lose Yourself in the Style of Linkin Park, featuring at Jonathan Young. It's excellent. Check it out. I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. Also, if you're only interested in the view, that part of the video is not the whole length of the video. See its length? Check the time codes in the description box. So, content warning and or trigger warning. We are... Yeah, so this movie features and or brings up the following, and I'm going to be discussing at least some of the following potentially triggering content of gaslighting, suicide, sexual assault and or rape, grief and mourning, abuse, abortion, miscarriage, mental illness, and yes, that covers it. So, this movie's rated R, and so is this video. Now, whether you hate or love this movie, or the other two, or you love them, or you're indifferent, or anything in between, I don't have a problem with you personally. I don't think that, you know, everybody who disagrees with me on movies is just like a bad person or something. If you express a viewpoint that is different from what I say in this video, the only thing I ask is that you keep it respectful and I will answer respectfully. If you write something hateful, whether it's directed towards me or anybody else, I'm most likely just going to ignore you. And I that brings it. yeah, I'm currently dealing with some pain in my back, but it's still a lot to say about the movies that I watch. So I might at least in t parts of this video speak faster. And yes, so I start this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up this paper that says spoilers. So, you know, you can mute and skip ahead until you see me lower this thing. And, yeah, I, I will probably be spoiling the first movie in the review itself. I don't think I'm going to wait until I get into it. But, but, yeah, and once I get into the, the thoughts section, I will no longer be warning before I go into spoilers for these first two movies. And let's see. Yeah, you know, basically the reason I did I'm doing a video on this movie is I really love the first movie. You know, I, I rewatched it again recently. It holds up <sighs> Yeah, it's not perfect. I went over my issues with it in my videos that I did on the movie. Yeah, 
I guess just morbid curiosity. I I had heard that it wasn't that this wasn't as good. I haven't watched the third one yet, but I hear that also is nowhere near as good. But it does at least sound like a slightly interesting. Like it goes in a different direction than this one does, so I appreciate that. But yeah. And yeah, I I'm not 100% certain. It's it's gonna be several weeks before I get to the third one. I guess. Yeah, because we've got some we've got some movies at the theater coming up. So yeah. Now. I am going to criticize some real people and ideas the real people believe in this video. Let me be very clear. I do not condone, condone any harassment or bullying. You can express an opinion, but do not harass or bully anyone. So, this movie is a remake. I try to grade any remake on a curve. The reason why is because I like not being miserable, which is what I will be if I focus on all the ways that it is inferior to the original. Very few remakes are as good as the one or multiple movies that it is a remake of. This is a remake because they figure that's a better way of ensuring making a lot of money off it. But it doesn't have to mean that it that everything about it is automatically bad, hence grading on a curve. Yeah, this this is called a sequel, but it clearly is just it's yeah. It's basically a remake of, of the first one. Technically, there's like one reference in the movie to the first one. So clearly this movie is set in a universe where the first movie did happen. But yeah, it doesn't have to be a bad thing for a sequel to in part be a remake of the first one. Terminator 2 adds a lot to the franchise. This movie adds absolutely nothing. Yeah, you know, it's a sequel that focuses on different characters in similar circumstance, but don't share characters with the film. It's a sequel too, so it's like a Final Destination sequel. Rather than I'm told a Saw sequel, I haven't, I've only watched the first of those movies. So, uh, yeah, my... A, a brief, a short list of some of the time travel movies that I've watched. The Terminator movies, Frequency, the Back to the Future trilogy, 12 Monkeys, the movie, not the show. I hear good things about the show. I might watch it at some point. Avengers Endgame, Deadpool 2, Men in Black 3, Paycheck, and Tenet. So this video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual it gets is when I sometimes act something out. So feel free to watch something visual in such as clips from the movie in another tab. I won't mind. So I got this movie on sale. So anything negative I say in this is not out of bitterness. I don't feel like the movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. And it's not that I'm upset at how it compares to first movie in the series, what I was expecting, the trailers and other marketing. I don't have some personal data against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I said in this are fair criticism based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. I am not expecting this thing to be... I, I, when I watched this, I wasn't expecting it to be Shakespeare or something. And that brings us right since we're still dealing with corona i want to say during this video it is possible that i will touch my face i want to show you i washed my hands since the last time i was outside and i will wash my hands again before going out and yeah so this is the very first viewing of this movie now the first movie i've probably watched at least a couple dozen times there was a period where i watched it very many times within a fairly short space of time. I guess back when it was fairly recent, yeah. So, the plot, you know, we are in present day. 
I forget which city, but an American city, and it's not New York because they specifically mention that, like, one of the characters would like to move to New York. Yeah, and a car accident ruins the life of Nick, and then he discovers that he can travel in time and he tries to see if he can fix things and let's see yeah basically like the Nick's plot armor does not extend to everyone involved in the car accident. Yes, he, he was in it himself and he makes it and he's not even like like for a while I think he's supposed to be in like a coma but then he just comes out of it and thinking about it I think the movie is implying that if not for the coma he might not have the ability to travel through time because nothing else seems to really happen like he gets you know that they mentioned that you know he has like nightmares but his mother says he's had those his whole life so that's not that didn't happen because of the car accident anyway right I also watched ah, hmm, is that yeah, source code isn't technically time travel so much as, yeah, it's kind of a spoiler to say specifically what's, anyway. The... Yeah. So, the, the writing of this movie. This was written by Michael D. Weiss. Who wrote nine direct-to-video things. Hmm. Is this not listed as one of those direct-to-video? Huh, okay. Uh, or what, or did I just, remember? anyway, nine direct-to-video things total. I didn't know they made it up to Jarhead 3, The Scorpion King 4, Hostel 3, Octopus 2, U.S. Seals 2. But he did write Octopus 1 as well, so they didn't bring in someone. So, so yeah, what, what, the, the, th He is known for writing schlock, basically. Now, he also wrote several movies. Yeah, yeah, it's listed as a theatrical release. I t t anyway, whatever. Eraser Reborn? I mean, I kind of respect that those two words contradict one another because if it's a sequel to Eraser, the whole point of that movie, the, the point of the Eraser, the Erasers in the movie is that they take away all your, or, or is it supposed to be, you get another, the Reborn is the part after they erase your old life. Anyway, whatever. Journey to the Center of the Earth, Cult of Fury. And apparently this was listed as inspired by John Frankenheimer. I mean RIP, the the he was he was dead when this movie came out, so it's not like he could have prevented them from doing so. I mean I haven't watched all that many movies that he directed, but all of them are better than this one. To, to briefly go through, those would be the Manchurian Candidate, Candidate, 
1962, the Holcroft Covenant, Year of the Gun, Ronin, and Reindeer Games. So, the first movie, part of the, the thing it goes into is that it's genetic, that he can travel through time. You know, it goes into how his father was destroyed by this power. And his grandfather. It's at least very heavily implied. I, f I forget if that's... That, m that might only be in the director's cut. I've only watched the director. I, I haven't watched... I forget if I've ever watched any other version. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, this movie doesn't even explore... The, the, yeah. I'm not saying that the movie has to repeat everything that the first one did. I basically, it's just that the, the stuff that it replaces it with isn't interesting. And, yeah, in, in the first movie, like, he has these blackouts his whole life. And here, the, yeah, the time travel ability is apparently unlocked. By the car accident and yeah you know it was it was specifically like one of the in in the first movie yeah I'm yeah I'm, I'm spoiling the first movie here in in the review of the second one in the first one with only one exception. Only at the very, very end can he travel back in time outside of one of the blackouts. All the other times that he travels in time, he travels specifically to one of the blackouts. And, you know, you can kind of theorize, did the blackouts open the door for time traveling? Or was he always going to time travel, and because of that, he had blackouts? You know, it's... yeah. And... Again, I'm not saying that you have to do that, but in this movie, it's basically like, you know... He looks at a picture, he focuses, and he can travel in time. I think... The limitation is that he, I, I don't think he can travel to, like, if there isn't, if, if he doesn't appear in the picture, I don't think he can travel, but, but that's it. That's the only limitation. And... Yeah, so in the yeah, the first movie the lead time traveled because his ex girlfriend committed suicide. He traveled in time to save her. That movie specifically said that like no matter what he did, he, you know, he would end up destroying someone's life. And, like, basically, it's not super tasteful of the movie to do it. And it is, yeah, it is something I take issue with, but the first movie basically says that it was because of Evan, the lead, that Kaylee committed suicide like she she wasn't happy before but the it, it was the conversation with him that especially upset her to the point where she committed suicide and yeah it is it's a significant aspect of the first movie that it is Evan's mistakes that you know may make things worse and and yeah and in this movie like 
it's a it's a car accident like there are movie car accidents and real life car accidents where you can point the finger and say okay that one person should have been more responsible and I mean I I guess you can kind of there's there's a thing or two in this where you could point to but I mean the trailer even tries to make it look less silly and less like but yeah yeah you I you can't really it's not you can't make a convincing case in my opinion that it's his fault that it is Nick's fault like it's a Sunday so he would figure he had the day off and his girlfriend Julie is you know it's her birthday but then his boss calls and tells him to come to work and I mean I I think the idea is supposed to be oh he should just like blow him off or you know say that you know well I only get so many days off kind of thing but it really the it just it feels unearned it doesn't feel like Nick made a huge mistake and now he has a chance to fix it it feels like something bad happened and now he has a chance to undo that bad thing and just it doesn't have the same weight to it again I'm not saying you have to repeat it it just feels like it it feels like the people making this movie didn't understand the appeal of the first movie now yeah yeah I think the the screenwriter wanted to communicate that you know Nick focuses too much on his job on his work rather than the people he cares about but it's very sloppily handled and yeah so quoting some fellow critics here the key to what made the first butterfly effect so interesting was the way its storyline interweaved the main characters back and forth from childhood to adulthood Evans' motivations were pure and designed to help everyone around him. He suffered real consequences for his actions. Nick, on the other hand, only seems interested in helping himself, and he winds up looking rather smarmy as a result. He doesn't treat his condition very seriously, and it's obvious Julie is much better off without him, even if that does... Uh, it's adding to the film's flaws of the filmmaker's decisions to keep all the time travel within the same one-year period re results and a closed off feeling that makes everything that happens much too predictable, and the attempt to unite the two films via a reference to Jason Tr Treborn, Evan's dad, only serves to confuse, confuse the issue even further. The acting is passable, but no one is really called upon to stretch their wings too much. Durance's Julie has one scene where she gets to look and act different from her norm, but otherwise everyone just plays the same version of themselves over and over again. It's a far cry from the first one with its wide range of time periods and character lifestyle changes. Let's see. Yeah, part two brings absolutely nothing new to the table, so it feels like so yeah, feels like nothing more than a cold rehash of leftovers that should have been just kept on the counter instead of dished up for mass consumption. It's like having hamburger the day after prime rib. Comparisons are inevitable. The scope of the Broadfly Effect 2 was way too limited. Kutcher's character of Evan Traborn in the first film was concerned with saving lives, averting molestation, stopping the death of children. It also spanned over the majority of Evan's life from child to manhood. The character was altruistic, attempting to make things better for others, but suddenly screwing things up for himself in the process. Nick Larson, the main cat in this new picture, apparently just wants nicer stuff. The time range stays within one year as well, which I assume was done due to budgetary constraints. I would almost that yeah. I would be extremely surprised if it was not that. And and yeah, it's just like I mean, this movie is shorter than the first one is, but you can still really feel that there isn't very much like 
I didn't make a note of it, but I think it's maybe half an hour into the first film before the first time travel, and certainly, like, he isn't an adult until around that. I, I would be very surprised if he was an adult. Maybe before, like, 20 minutes into that movie, you know. And we still have scenes with the, the kids and teenager versions of themselves after that. But this, yeah, it's... Like, the, the time travel happens one year after the the accident and he travels more than once but yeah he he tends to travel i'm not gonna give away whether he only travels or only tries to travel but several times he just travels back one year and then they do the thing of you know he wakes up and because it's been an entire year you know things have changed a lot it wouldn't make sense if things hadn't changed the if, if things changed overnight or something Did the guy that made, back to critic quote, did the guy that made this even watch the first one? Probably not. A load of aspects from the first, such as blackouts in their youth, have been removed, plus seeing the main character in their childhood sort of made you connect more with the character. Here, you learn nothing about the bland main characters whatsoever. The movie was very badly written. There were many inconsistencies throughout the movie, such as mentioning... Oh, did they do that? Mention a car accident when in that reality there wasn't one? I mean, I think that's... I'm not going to talk about it before the spoiler section, but the way they handle the car accident is... It's just... I, I do not understand why they made the choice they did. If they wanted to make a good sequel, they should have actually made a prequel detailing Evan's father's experiences with the butterfly effect. Now that would have been great. I think there's... yeah, there, there is something interesting there. The first movie set up a great sequel by noting that the father had pictures he drew that he could flashback with. And we were left to guess he must have painted himself into a corner by flashing back to a time when he didn't have any pictures left. It would be better if the sequel focused on that instead. It doesn't. I definitely agree with the other comments on how the movie was drawn out and felt too long. There's no explanation behind why he can go back in time. And when he does, even for the first time, he doesn't seem surprised at what he just did. He just looks around for two seconds and then kind of go, Oh, okay. I've gone back in time. Absolute rubbish. The film explores the jumping of realities. Huh. Okay, never mind. You know, I never knew there was a sequel to The Butterfly Effect until today. I didn't even think a sequel was possible, considering how the first one ended. After seeing part two, I'm sorry I found out about it. I know that sequels are hardly ever as good as the first one. Heck, they're usually not even worth the celluloid they're filmed on. Yet still, I watched this on the strength of the first installment. Part 2 was the same, but less unique, less intriguing, less gritty, less breathtaking, less good. The only thing it was more of was erotic. This was the Cinemax softcore porn edition of the first one. I actually wonder if this movie has anything to do with the first one besides the name. This was so lazy and thoughtless. All I ask is that if you're going to make a sequel, put in a little effort. And in the first movie, I was on the edge of my seat to find out what was going to happen next. I was surprised by the clever plot and writing. The sequel had none of these things. I was on the edge of my seat, all right, ready to shut the stupid thing off if it got any worse. The time-shifting plot line is actually pretty boring. Now,
of the sequence of events that leads him to despair in a variety of largely unimaginative ways. I'm kind of having the feeling I have only seen just a part of the movie. Every twist Nick caused in his reality wasn't well argued. We didn't see some explanation, some feeling of his character adapting to that reality. Secondly, I definitely think that he gave up too easily. And... Every time he goes in some parallel reality, the story lasts too much without necessarily adding something really important to the story. The plot is too superficial this time. Now that we've accustomed to those time twists, we have nothing to get stunned from. And with that goes, there goes the pleasure of seeing a movie. And... Yeah, so... Plot twists. It does not handle plot twists particularly well. Overall, I think an argument could be made that there are a few too many, and some of them are quite bad. I suppose they might be too easy to figure out for the viewer if you watched the first movie. So, moving on to the direction. This was directed by John R. Leonetti, who has nine movie credits, two of them not done yet. And, yeah, I gotta admit, I, like, oh, right, okay, Annabelle, that's what I've heard of, and he directed Mortal Kombat Annihilation, so this is not the first time he did a really cheap-looking movie. He's primarily known as a cinematographer. He did, he has 15 TV credits, 23 movie credits, let's see, ah, Piranha 3D. The Scorpion King, Spy Hard, Mortal Kombat 1, which I guess is how he got the job for Mortal Kombat 2, The Mask, yeah, so he's, he's talented as a DP. The first movie, you can very clearly, again, like, love it or hate it, you're completely allowed to hate the first movie. But I think it would be hard to argue that the directors didn't care. Like, you can really tell that it's a passion project. And you can really tell that this wasn't really... Like, apparently, John Arleonetti, he did want to make a good movie. And then they, like, moved the production and cut the budget and they had to film in like at a time when it was kind of difficult to film because of weather and such and he expresses frustration at that on the DVD and that really that does suck I I feel bad for him but even without that this movie was never going to turn out particularly good like yeah now, the first movie is Melodramatic Misery Porn. Yeah, this one isn't. And, I, yeah, I guess it's up to personal interpretation whether that's good or bad. I, What I will say is, I think a strong argument could be made that it would be much more on-brand if this was also. Now, according to Wikipedia, the movie was met with negative reviews. Reviews claim that the sequel adds nothing to the message of the first one, the movie covering exactly the same ground with different characters. The limited temporal scope of the story of this movie isn't as intertwined as the first. Also, the less impressive special effects and very short filming time combined to give the movie 
a much less impressive field than the original. It, it, it received a negative reception from real film reviews, which called it an abominable, pointless sequel. And, yeah. Director John R. Leonetti is the younger brother of Matthew F. Leonetti, the director of photography of the first Butterfly Effect. That's probably how he got the job, because it really doesn't... Like, there's nothing that jumps out at you that says, like, this, this guy is perfect for, for directing this. And, yeah, so, fellow critic quotes, a lot of the characters make really bad decisions, which makes it very frustrating to watch. And... With deplorable acting and a poorly delivered script, shooting a film was done in 20 days. Made cheaply in Canada, it comes across as a really cheap TV show. During the making of Featurette on the DVD, director John, Joe Leonetti seemed visibly upset with what he was saddled with in the making of the film. With making the film. He was given 20 days to shoot, and a script had to be altered on the fly due to environmental and cost concerns. His frustration was evident in the final product. The Butterfly Effect 2 wasn't a bad movie or a good movie, just an inconsequential one that seemed a waste of time for those making it, and ultimately a waste of time for those of us that watched it. If you really enjoyed The Butterfly Effect, it might actually be worth giving the sequel a rental spell. It's not really a good film, but it is surprisingly hard to find one intention. Just don't be surprised when you're disappointed by the lackluster second half. Serious fans of science fiction and complex storytelling are better off leaving this on the shelf. This idea has been handled with much more intelligence in the past, will probably be handled much better in the future. John Leonetti should stick to his real field cinematography because he excels in that department and fails at being a director. They could have done so much more with it had they spent a little more than 20 days working on it. A fact that is hammered home repeatedly throughout the bonus features on the DVD. That's how all the surprises are delivered, with the subtlety of a brick to the face. Leonetti's direction is bland. The Butterfly Effect 2 has the look of a TV movie. Yeah. First film was exceedingly vague as to the process whereby Ashton Kutcher was able to fl time flip, but at least when the main plot caked in, it held a compulsive fascination. Whereas here, there is not even that. Indeed, without having seen the first film, it would be almost impossible to understand what is going on here by watching the film on its own. The tone of the director is half TV prime story, half soap opera. Looks a little unfit for the subject. Yeah, that is very true. Crime story, soap opera. That's, that's, yeah, very well put. So the opening of the movie, to, like, the first several minutes of this movie are Nick... Julie and let's see their friend Trevor I don't remember Trevor's girlfriend's name the four of them and the movie's trying really hard to get us to care about them before the tragedy but it doesn't do a particularly good job of it they're just not like they're not interesting they're not like Nick isn't particularly likable <sighs> yeah I just I don't know why the yeah they just they didn't know how to make them seem appealing now I'm not going to give away whether the ending is happy or sad but if it's with what came before and yeah it's a it's a bad ending and I don't, I'm, I'm not saying like, oh, it's not a happy end. No, no, I mean, this is just, again, it's my opinion. You don't have to agree. But I really don't think that the ending is as compelling as the filmmakers appear to. I, 
yeah, it doesn't really rely on Deus Ex Machina. It does rely on other convenient writing, but honestly, the like other parts of the movie also have very convenient writing at times. The last three minutes seemed rushed as though the director ran out of money and was forced to end the story sooner than he hoped. Yeah, that's actually, that's very true. It does feel like that. And the ending titles leave you in the same emotion as the ending causes, thus following up on the ending. I... Yeah, this is the part where I'm where I I've noted that I should talk about whether the movie lost my interest along the way. I mean, for that to be the case, I would have had to be interested at all, which the movie never really gave me much of a reason to be like the car crash itself, which happens you know happens very early on. It is compelling. And it should be something where you can really, like, everybody can relate to something awful happening to someone you care about. But it just felt so contrived. Like, they were, the, the movie is so careful to create this ridiculous situation. Now... <clears throat> That brings us to the characters. So yeah, Eric Lively plays Nick Larson. And I've seen others point out, you know, you, you can't really identify with him. I don't think that movies have to have, like, characters that are easy to identify with even even as the leads it's okay if your characters are assholes but they need to be interesting assholes and he is not an interesting asshole so from quoting some fellow critics the actions are lacking logic the main character seems to adapt to the new future really fast but in the meantime pretends like he does not have an idea what is happening given that some of these reworkings inevitably revolves around saving the life of a loved one. The stakes are still pretty high, and the hero's joy at his success in bringing Julie back is done touchingly well. That is, yeah, legitimately pretty decent. Yeah. We were given no history into this character whatsoever, and the amount of time he spent changing his life meant we could never really get used to him as he was constantly changing his memories. Erica Durant plays Julie Miller. You know, in, in this movie, like, she's with an okay guy. He's no Superman. And... Yeah, I... I... I'm, I'm going to quote a critic here. There are probably plenty of moments that you can pick apart if you are so inclined. Like when Eric Lively goes back in time for the first time and he knows that a car accident is about to happen. But instead of pulling over his car immediately, he merely orders Erica Durant to put on her seatbelt. It, yeah. Holy crap, that was... Like this, it feels like a movie made by out-of-touch... Like, people who work within, like, filmmaking, and they have, like, an okay job, and they're, they're, like, they have what they need, but they want more, and so they write this story about a guy who also wants more, not realizing that regular people, like, we don't find it that relatable, that he's willing to... Like, both of these movies make clear when you change the past, you you can't be sure exactly what happens with the future. You know, you could you could ruin everything. 
and he does it because he wants more money. Like he's he's doing okay. Like essentially, like his his boss is a jerk, but I mean that's and and that sucks. I'm I he has my my sympathy for sure. But the movie, it it's not just that. Oh, he you know he. Like I I guess it's supposed to be that like American dream thing. Where you know supposedly every. American who isn't already successful wants to be successful but it just it does not feel <sighs> yeah like it it just it feels like it's like wish fulfillment for like for for a, a chunk of the movie Nick is going back in time and changing things to make sure it works out better for him and sometimes also for his friends and the movie doesn't really, yeah, like, there's no real justification for why he doesn't just try to live with things the way they are. And, again, I get it. I'm, I'm not saying that, like, I, I think we should all do what we can to make sure that things are... You know, if if you have to fight to improve your life, then you know sometimes that fight is really well worth it. But here, it just doesn't really feel. Yeah. And. Brings us uh, here. We go. Yeah. So the yeah, Erica Durant says in an interview on the DVD. You know, Julie is a very honest person and loves Nick one hundred and fifty percent. And several of the actors express that they really love the Butterfly Effect 1. And they're really happy to be acting in a movie that's about time travel. And yeah, so quoting fellow critics, the rest of the cast might as well be cardboard cutouts. They just aren't very interesting. Maybe the goofy slash quote, Enemy, Dork Dave, played by David Lewis, is okay. To be fair, most of the actors put a lot of effort into their roles. Eric Lively delivers a subtle, intelligent performance that deserves to be in a much better film. The supporting cast is also strong, as though completely unaware of the type of film they are in. Eric Lively gave life to the main character, but it was a fiasco. I don't know if it was the actor's fault. Of the bad script or John Leonetti's bad direction, the fact is that everything went wrong and the actor did a bad job, especially from the middle, in which his character essentially becomes a scornful idiot. Erica Durant is too sugary and unofficial, and the remaining cast is better said no more. The actors were all from Canadian sci-fi shows, and I've seen them do better in them. I did... I think the only one of them I know from anything else is Erica Durance. And yeah, she's she's a lot better on Smallville than she is here. I love alternate possibility stories. The trouble here is that the alternatives simply aren't that interesting. Far too much centers around the work rivalry between Nick and rival Bristol. And frankly, they were both as bad as each other. And I didn't care which one came out on top. Eric Lively, contrary to his name, is an insipid lead. Dustin Mulligan's Trevor is an irritating and unsympathetic second fiddle. And for a film which runs... Okay, so the, yeah, this person wrote that it runs 88 minutes. If you count the end credits, sure, but without... But I'll get to that for pretty soon. It is so leisurely in going about its business that at times I felt like shouting, Get on with it. Or failing that... 
do something. Milligan shows a lot of emotion and is really good in this role. Gene Holden and David Lewis are also amongst the supporting cast, but never really do anything that stands out. And the acting. On a scale of 1 to 10, I give these actors a 7. Not horrible, not great. And I thought Ashton wasn't any good until I saw Butterfly Effect 1. These actors seem to be right out of acting school. Shallow, unconvincing, almost expressionless. I, like another review, wonder why this film never sold the theater. Now, I now know. So yeah, the, the dialogue is just insipid. It's so boring and bland. Yeah, I I don't it's it's not well written. It's not well delivered. The the exposition is very awkward like I I think the the for for how subtle it was, they might as well have had like a um an auga horn and like a like a buzzer and like just it's it's ridiculous how obvious it is, you know. This is important for later. Now, the cinematography was handled by Brian Pearson, who has 24 movie credits. And yeah, so he's done F Final Destination movie. Um, one of those he did my bloody valentine white noise urban legends final hut so so yeah he does these kinds of movies he also has 19 tv credits 10 short credits two video credits and he's credited for camera department for 26 movies 11 tv shows and two shorts so he has experience And yeah, quoting fellow critics, the photography and lighting capture all the love showing the intimacy of the relationships. First off, the sound image leave you with the impression that most of the movie shot with a handheld camera. Don't get me wrong though, that's not such a bad thing when used with some restraint, like for example, Born Supremacy, or totally enhanced experience, unlike here where it just felt low budget. Cinematography and photography were okay, I guess. Nothing too fancy, nothing horrible or out of place. It was just okay. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't call it, like, incompetent, but it's definitely not impressive. And the editing was handled by Jacqueline Campus and Chris... Conley. Now, for some reason, I copied in absolutely everything they added. Okay, so Jacqueline Cambos has 30 credits for, for feature movies as an editor. So let's see the most of these movies I never even heard of. And Chris Conley was the editorial department. For, he has he has twenty nine TV credits as as that. And then Yeah, and 31 movie credits for editor. So again, a lot of experience. The editing is perfectly fine. I I found it to be kind of like I I suppose if I were to point to something that the editor did wrong, there's definitely 
like the movie should have been trimmed to be shorter. And I realize, I, th I think they basically used every scene that like, I'm not sure they cut much of anything. I think every scene they filmed, they edited and put in the movie. And I mean, I get like, certainly there are, there are scenes in this movie where you can you can understand why they couldn't cut them you get why they're there but that doesn't mean that they aren't boring and go on for too long there's there are multiple scenes of nick sitting at a table with other people talking and i i think it's supposed to be engaging not always tense but at the very least engaging and like in an early scene julie says nick is always like always a salesman and that yeah that's very true and i think these scenes are supposed to be legitimate it's, it's, uh, yeah you know what it when i think about it, it kind of reads reads it, it the movie kind of plays like the writer based nick on himself and he's imagining trying to pitch the movie to someone and obviously for him that kind of situation is compelling because it's his job if he doesn't do it well that you know that could have serious consequences for him but it's not very entertaining to watch and yeah like I'm, i mean i don't know i i'm not like asking for there to be like a gun held to someone's head in these scenes but i do think that there are there's too much talking in the movie that doesn't i mean honestly yeah, yeah, thinking about it. One of these scenes two three? Yeah, there are multiple scenes in this movie that you could cut, and I don't think I think the only reason that they didn't I I don't think they're delusional enough to think they're good. They they did what they could. I'll I'll grant that they did what they could with what they had, but I think they just knew that if the movie they you know if it's if it is much shorter than it is then it you know I I mean it doesn't break ninety minutes even with the end credits so it's not like that but yeah it they didn't have enough certainly not enough interesting stuff. For a feature film here. Now, the special effects are very limited, but that doesn't mean that the they're not particularly impressive. Like there's, you know, like in the first, there's this visual effects for the the time warping and they're just yeah it it's not very impressive looking in the first one you know it's not like something i would point to as like you have to watch the movie because of this but there was a feeling of like it felt real it felt visceral it felt like you were in evan's head jumping through time and being really messed up by that discombobulated and in this it just kind of feels like we're just sitting there watching an obvious effect for you know the little bit of time it takes for him to tr travel and that's it that they really didn't
I don't want to. I don't want to harp on people not having a big budget because uh, you know it's not like. I mean, unless a bunch of the budget like went up a producer's nose, it's not like there's something they could really have done about it. But there is such a thing as saying, as as looking at the script and looking at the budget offered, and saying, I don't think there's enough money to make something I mean even if you don't take that much pride in your own work which I mean based on the DVD it seems like they do but even if not I mean who wants there to be more movies that are just average out there like if if this movie had a couple more million in a, in the budget if they had a longer shooting schedule, and those two things are, of course, connected. And if the script had just been, like, there could really have been something compelling here. Now, there are some, you know, the, the stunt work is a bit of a mixed bag. I would definitely say some of it is really, like, the car crash itself is pretty decently done for the budget and uh, there's this bit where like someone like rolls down something and yeah they they did a good job with the the stunt yeah this this had a 6 million dollar budget and, yeah, I'm not the first person to point out, you can tell that it's low budget, which, you know, six million. I would be very happy if I had six million dollars, but it's not enough to make a movie like this. You know, with stunts, special effects, you know, the, the amount of settings and different situations, you know, that it would also be one thing if they could... Like, just quick example, the movie Cube was also very low budget, but it does a pretty good job hiding that, partially because of the issue with the sets, because Cube is a movie about a small group of people who are trapped in a rectangle, I'm kidding, a cube, and they're crawling through vents, moving from room to room. And I'm not going to say if it's every single room, but certainly many of these rooms are this, this cube-shaped, you know, there's, there's sometimes a, you know, some important differences between rooms. But what you, what they did was they had this one cube set that they would film all of these, you know, tons of different scenes in this one set. And, you know, every so often, because the scene called for it, they would mess around with the set, make it a little bit more distinct. But that saved tremendously in in both the, the cost of, of sets and you know the the cost of how many people they had to get to build and change the sets you know transport between like if you if you operate on maybe only one set you know you yeah you can you don't have to worry about transport cost or time and this movie you know yeah it has a decent amount of sets it's it's better than you might think. It I I I had thought it would be worse than it turned out to be. So yeah, you know, setting like we start on this ah, what's it called? Um, it's close to water, but it's not a beach. I guess like a cliffside thing. Yeah, something like that. And, you know, in one of the time, yeah, 
the the we we see that Nick is wealthy and he what's the word you know he has this really expensive apartment which I wouldn't rule out was maybe just like the producer's place and he was like okay fine just don't mess anything up and you better be done within an hour or you're gonna be in trouble you know but yeah there's this nightclub there are various offices the place that the, the um, Nick works at a startup uh, you know the yeah there's a decent amount of sets and decent enough variety considering how much of the movie is either him like talking to Julie or Trevor about like personal stuff or like him work you know yeah trying to work out money stuff by talking to other guys in you know relatively yeah, in you know, there's there's a meeting in a club, there's a meeting in a restaurant, and it's just like we we get it, and and again, several of these scenes, I I swear I'm 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 trying to avoid repeating myself. The thing I didn't mention before is they're trying to build tension i can tell by the rhythm of the editing and the the acting performances they're definitely trying to build tension with these scenes that's part of why they're longer that you know they don't get to the point immediately in part because of the, you know and and really this movie could have been much slower and and longer if you know if we were unfortunate yeah the the it it is a movie that just yeah features too there's not enough variety in the actual situations, even though the settings have decent variety. Although, you know, they're all variations on the theme of, you know, it's the big city, other, other than the, the cliffside. I mean, it's the big city, and it's very frequently where rich people, like, dine or spend, otherwise spend spare time. I, yeah, so let's see the, the, the score was handled by Michael Subi, who was the composer, he, he has 30 TV credits and 11 movie credits, and, right, and some shorts and documentaries as well. Now, he actually did do music for the first one, so there is one person who returned, you know, yeah, who did the first, worked on the first movie and returned for this one. He also did the Zodiac, the, you know, yeah, it's, it's, the, the score is good, it's, it's done well. Oh, huh. Right. One of my fellow critics points out, a big bunch of music was used from the first movie, which doesn't fit in very well in some scenes. I was having trouble putting my finger on it, but that's exactly right. And that's why, I'm not even, yeah, thinking about it, I'm not sure he composed anything new for this one. It's just that they had the rights to it, and IMDb didn't list it as whether or not yeah it his credit is music composed by for for this movie 
doesn't say that it was specifically composed for this movie. Yeah. Now, the, the licensed music, I was able to find three of the eight songs on YouTube and, yeah, you know, captures the voice of youth today, and that is definitely what this movie is. Uh, yeah, this movie is made for, you know, 20 and 30-somethings. I don't personally have much to say about the sound design, but I did want to quote a fellow critic. The 40 minutes I watched were full of bad effects and loud, obnoxious noises that were apparently supposed to indicate suspense. Ouch. So, yeah, the, the, tonally, this movie is trying to depress you like the first was, albeit somewhat less so. Now, when I read reviews for this movie, I saw a bunch of people who said, oh, these, you know, these, these butterfly effect movies, they're way too dark and, and upsetting and such. Everybody has a right to their own opinion. And some people are going to steal their opinion from someone else. But I don't think you should give a negative review to something just because it doesn't fit your personal preferences. Like, if you want to see fiction that has time travel that isn't, like, bleak and depressing, watch the Back to the Future trilogy. You know, it's not like you... I, they're not my favorite movies, but they're three well-made movies that are about time travel, and, you know, sometimes there's some, like, material that gets, you know, potentially upsetting. But it's not like... Yeah. But this is for people who don't want... You know, the... the yeah, the, the Butterfly Effect movies are for people who want time travel and something really dark and bleak. You know, other than, yes, I realize that the time machine, the, the remake, exists, but that's not a particularly good movie. I cannot speak to the original movie. I haven't watched it yet. Now, let's see. As far as I, th I think this movie got into the the time timeline changing quicker than the first one, and I don't think like I mean I don't think the first movie would be better if it got into the time travel faster, but this movie definitely like early the the first chunk of this movie was trying to make us like these characters and failing and so once the time travel started you know you your interests what's what's the word Pick, picks up a little you know and yeah so i think it was very smart picks. yeah quoting fellow critics at 90 odd minutes the butterfly effect 2 isn't a particularly long film but it does feel that way as it does tend to drag the only problem I really had with this was it lagged a bit in the middle sometimes. So yeah, I already mentioned that the movie is an hour and 28 minutes long with end credits. But if you do not count the end credits, and there's no there's no post credit scene, there's nothing like... If you like the ending, you might enjoy sitting and listening to the music and, and watching the end credits. Because like I said earlier... The movie, the the end, yeah, the end credits are are this have the same kind of mood to them as the ending does. But without end credits, this movie is only one hour and eighteen minutes long. That's ridiculous. Like I, 
that's the that's that's just barely a feature length I, at least by stand I, I mean I think technically 45 minutes is the minimum for feature length but you know nobody's expecting a movie to go to theaters that's only around 45 minutes just like nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition but again just brief comparison the first movie without end credits is an hour and 49 minutes so if you're keeping track that's 31 minutes longer and if you count the end credits is an hour 54 and a half minutes so the end credits are actually about half as long even though there must have been more people working on that one than this one it's a bigger production anyway yeah this movie has less depth and substance than the first movie So, this is, this is the part where I'm supposed to talk about the best scenes, the best elements of the movie. I mean, let's see, I guess if I had to choose something... it really could have been a lot worse like it's not as slow and boring as I thought it was going to be and as other movies like this often are that's yeah <sighs> the worst aspect is this is a very inferior version of the first movie. Worst aspect according to others is the production looking like a TV movie. I was most worried that it had nothing to add to the series, that it was just a cash grab and we lived down to my expectations. I was looking forward to compelling time travel scenes and the movie failed to live up to my expectations. The trailer gives away at least a little bit too much. I only found one trailer, a minute and 46 seconds or something. The cover and poster do not give too much away, and in both cases, if you like the, the trailer or the cover and poster and such, you're more likely to like the movie than if not. I search for YouTube videos when I do these movies and I really did not find very many things about this movie. The, the trailer, I found a handful of clips, found, was there only one? At, at least one fan music video, two other video reviews. If I hadn't watched the Shameful Sequels video on this movie, I might not even know that there was one, much less two sequels to The Butterfly Effect, but that video isn't even, isn't even on YouTube anymore. It is online, but you have to search for it. I do quite like that, you know, some people cared so much about this movie that they were inspired to make fan music videos. I, I'm really happy for them. I've made, you know, I've, I've edited music videos about movies and TV shows that I care about. And, yeah, it's a, it's a healthy way to express that you're a fan. I'm really glad that some people liked this movie enough to do that, even though I don't myself. If you've never tried, like, I, it's been a while since I did editing myself, but I'm sure there are still good 
not excellent but good editing programs out there that are free and yeah if if you at all care about movie editing it's you know you can learn a lot from even just editing something short just like take a, a movie scene that you either love or hate and re-edit it and see if you know if you can change the tone or feel and and such you know it's it's very yeah it's I, I heartily recommend it to anyone who thinks that they might enjoy doing so this doesn't have any rating on the tomato meter there's only two reviews and yeah the audience score is 27 percent based on over a hundred thousand ratings Yeah, the the average rating is 2.4 out of 5. Yeah, 27%, only 27% of the people who had watched the movie rated it 3.5 stars or higher. So that helps you get an idea of how, like, yeah, this is not a particularly well-liked movie. It's not on Metacritic at all. So on IMDb, there were only 130 IMDb user reviews. And that's why I read all of them. Normally, I only read the top voted 100. But when there's that few, the reviews are mostly negative. By star rating, there are two reviews that give it 10 out of 10, one that gives it a 9, 6 that give it an 8, 9 that give it a 7, 16 that give it a 6, 12 that give it a 5, 12 that give it a 4, 9 that give it a 3, 17 that give it a 2, and 35 that give it a 1. And the the overall rating on IMDb is four point five out of ten, based on thirty five thousand four hundred eighty four IMDb user users voting. So, 21.6% give it a 5, 19.8 give it a 4, 14.8 give it a 6, 12.6 give it a 3, 8.5 give it a 1, 7.8 give it a 2. This is not a well-received movie, going by these votes. So... There's not a lot of violence in this movie. Some of the violence is fairly, like, I'm not sure the word is graphic. Actually, yeah, the thing, I think the word is graphic. It's just not necessarily very convincing. And the... And, and it's the, the kind of thing, like, you don't have to have a lot of violence in your movie. It, it does, I would definitely say it feels like this movie, some of the violence is there. Specifically because they didn't think very many people would watch it if there wasn't very much violence in it. And then there's the sex. So I'm going to co quote some fellow critics here. The amount of sex infused in this movie is unjustified for this storyline. It isn't placed to create an atmosphere like in Lord of War. It just seems thrown in because the director was clueless. Frankly, the film also seeks to outdo its predecessor in being more sexy and risky in various ways at various moments. 
but really it seems to do that a little out of desperation, seeing Lindsay Maxwell as One issue with the film is that there are points where it reminds me of a late night Cinemax skin flick. Or Skinemax. There are some softcore porn sequences that feel placed in the film to attract attract that audience base. I feel it cheapens the movie and takes the focus off a relatively decent storyline. I wouldn't sing such high praise about the storyline, but otherwise, yeah. Yeah, basically the sex scenes are there in the hopes that it'll attract more people to rent the movie. It's not like the first movie had no sex, but it didn't feel so desperate. Like the first movie, the the sex scenes were, and and like scenes that are right before and after sex and such like they were either they they tended to to like communicate something about characters like how you know we see right after Evan and Kaylee have sex and she points out that he's a much more selfless lover now than she's used to him being you know, so there was a point there. It's it's uh, you know, it's it's communicating that the time that he had an easier life, he also you know, the the person that he was became less less selfless. Now, yeah, you know, and then there were various scenes where it's funny that Thumper is having sex, you know, yeah, very, very close to Ethan, and, you know, I mean, it's basically, it's a joke about college dorms, you know, they're, they're pointing out that, you know, a lot of college dorms, you're gonna have someone who just can't wait until their roommate is asleep or has left the, the room before they start having sex. And yeah. And it builds to the, the twist when it turns out that the two people having sex in the bed close to Evan aren't Thumper and some girl, some goth girl he's with, but Kaylee and I can't believe I'm blanking on his name Lenny and yeah the the <laughs> you, you know again you don't have to agree you don't have to like it but the it wasn't just there for titillation, and in this movie, it's there for titillation. You know, there are, on more than one occasion, in this movie, you know, young, a young woman will strip to her underwear at least, and just, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's something inherently wrong with that kind of scene, but it just, it's not telling us anything. And it's, it, you could remove them and people wouldn't even notice because it doesn't feel natural for there to be a sex scene. Like, a lot of the times when a movie has been censored, you can tell. Even if you haven't watched the original, you, you watch it and you're like, oh, they cut something out there. There was supposed to be something there because the movie was building towards it. And in this, it just comes out of nowhere. Like, it kind of, honestly, you know what? I think there's some chance that the sex scenes were added late. I, I could be wrong. Maybe it was the first thing the writer wrote. But I think there's some chance that, like, the, the writer handed in the script and the producer gave back notes, add sex scenes. 
you know, and so he was like, I mean, it's not going to fit anywhere. That was not, that pun was not intentional. But yeah, he, he tried to find somewhere and he just found the arguably least awkward places to, to put them. But yeah, and it's also just like, I don't blame any actress that doesn't want to do nudity, especially for a film like this. But if, and, and, you know, honestly, you know, if the, if the sex scene is going to be so gratuitous, then, you know, not having nudity in it. Anyway, if you're dealing with that situation, you should try to film it in a way where the audience doesn't, like, can't clearly see that the underwear is still on. Like, I don't... It's just, it's the, some, some parts of this movie are just so badly handled. So, I... Yeah, as far as who should watch this movie, I'm going to go ahead and quote a fellow critic here. Since I can't recommend the film to people that liked The Butterfly Effect, the only audience out there that I could see actually finding the story intriguing would be those that have never seen the original but find the premise interesting. So the DVD comes with the aforementioned trailer, and there are... Let's see. Coming soon, and it's like two trailers, it looks like. Altering Reality on the set of The Butterfly Effect 2, which is 15 minutes and 26 seconds. And it's basically a behind the scenes. And just under 11 minutes of cast and crew interviews with, you know, the lead actors and the director. Obviously, the following isn't actually a big deal, but I do appreciate the neat detail that on the DVD, they use a Polaroid for each different scene, and they all have short names, so it's as if Nick experienced the movie, took Polaroids along the way, and can now use them to jump to any scene, and that's I appreciate that the, the, you know, it's not a huge amount of effort and it's, it's kind of a gimme, it's an obvious thing to do, but yeah, like if, if you're going to have, yeah, it's, it's, I like it. But, but yeah, overall, I wouldn't really say that the DVD, it's not, like, if you just want to watch the movie itself, like, unless it's, like, greatly discounted, there's no, you don't need the DVD. Like, there's not, like, director's commentary or something just really incredible that, like, yeah. And, yeah. You can stream the movie on Vudu, Google Play, and Amazon Instant Video. So, yeah. I rank, I rate this five pointless remakes out of ten. So, yeah, I've been, recently, I've tried, you know, I, I tried to go into whether or not, like, uh, is it a movie that I would watch again soon? Is it a movie that I look forward to watching again? Am I happy that I watched it? That kind of thing. And the answer to all three is no. And that brings us to the spoiler sections 
So yeah, the rest of the video contains spoilers for both this movie and the first one. And if you want to watch my video for the first one, you know, you can search for it here on my channel. So yeah, the rest of this video is not a review, it's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of it is analysis, some of it is MSC3K, riff tracks, and other jokes. And so, yeah, so the time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this is thoughts in my head while watching in chronological order. You can think of say running commentary, live tweeting, and the like. And the section after that is thoughts in my head before watching. So. The first section, notes taken while watching. We will get a hotel room. Baby? A baby is definitely already on the way. Good guess. She takes off her seatbelt because she definitely won't be able to take a picture of Trevor and Amanda kissing at any other point. They only kiss once a year, actually. Used to use it to help predict if winter is over. The crash is just so contrived. Nick's tires blow out, and within seconds, there's a truck speeding heading towards them. I think there's some chance that the truck would be slow on the brakes, and some truckers have to drive extremely far. It was something completely unexpected. I mean, at the end of the day, every single bad thing that happened in the first movie was the result of an awful, awful thing done by one or more evil people. Sometimes it was an overreaction to the evil things done. But there was always one original evil thing you could trace it back to. But uh, I should clarify. When I say overreaction, I mean the couple of times where someone killed someone else because of the thing the other person did. I'm not talking about the, the suicides. I'm not going to get into whether or not that is an overreaction or not. I'm not touching that one. But yeah, there, there was always one original evil thing you could trace it back to. And that's just not the case here. And it makes it less effective. I I get the, you know, the idea is supposed to be that you should have blown off work. It's supposed to be a message about not caring more about your career than your loved ones. But he was called into work, like, if you wanted it to be about how he's way too obsessed with work and he's placing it before his loved ones, make it that it was his own idea to go to work. And other characters tell us that he gets nightmares and headaches and have his entire life. And that's, well, the nightmares was his entire life. I'm not sure he got headaches before. And that's supposed to be in place of us actually seeing his childhood and teenage years, like we did in the first one. Okay, so he travels back in time. And somehow this time, despite the blown tires, he can drive. Now, he doesn't drive very far, so I guess that's possible. Why does he wait until the last second to drive out of the path of the truck? And did he still... Yeah, I think the he still... Like the, the, he got hurt or someone got hurt in the car because he drove, like he, he rammed right into that, was it like a rock or something? And like the, I'm pretty sure the, the airbag blew. Yeah, the, the, uh, let me think. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know enough about cars to say if, like, he also, on th this time, he managed to, like, the first time the car was also, like, spinning somewhat, and that was part of, and then, not the whole time, but some of the time, and this time he managed to prevent it from spinning, and aimed it away from the truck and then for some reason I guess false tension waited until the last second 
it is really freaking good. Freaking? He's been saying fuck up to this point. Did he literally run out of fucks to give? I didn't know that was possible. Someone should really warn Quentin Tarantino. God, I could be watching Quentin Tarantino movie instead of this. Nick researches the symptoms that he's been having. Briefly, Jason, the father of Evan from the first movie, is mentioned in an article, which is as much as this movie does in justifying calling itself a sequel instead of a remake. I guess you've heard all the problems of the startup. If they do a third mention of the fact that 80% of all startups fail in the last two years, ah, crap, it's too late for me to start drink a drinking game, isn't it? Congratulations, Nick, you're fired. Anyone else? Fingers crossed for Lucy Lou running across the table, chopping someone's head off. We get a hint at the fact that she was pregnant and lost the baby because of it. They're not completely happy together, even though it appeared that way at first. Maybe I'll be a technical copy editor. Careful with that beer. Last time you spilled one, you ended up traveling back in time. And within about a minute, he literally did start traveling in time. I was joking. It was a joke. I was not being serious. Holy crap, at least this time the time travel was intentional. Like, it could be a problem if every time he drinks something to get buzzed, he ends up t time traveling. And Nick spills the drink on Dave's lap because, and, and everyone around laughs. Because the movie has the maturity level of a 12 year old. I know you need those spreadsheets. Ah, so the roles are completely reversed now. Clean up that desk. It's a mess. So now he completely embraces being as much of a douche as they was when their roles were reversed. I guess the idea is supposed to be that he's being corrupted by the success. Because that wasn't him, like, the, the other... Like, the memories coming into play, like, it is later when the, when he keeps trying to stall because he doesn't know what the numbers are that, you know, his boss keeps asking for. You know what they say about startups. It's only jokes that have to follow the rule of threes. You know that, right? He wants his money back. Look at what he did to my face. Oh, I see. You're worried that you're going to end up with your car breaking down in Arizona, getting into trouble with the locals, aren't you? Billy Bob Thornton, Jennifer Lopez, Nick Nolte. Much better movie than this one. We spent all the money we had and more. That's not possible. You wouldn't think so. Movie, just because you admit you're badly written doesn't mean you're not still badly written. I'm not sure why the movie feels like it has to be so heavy-handed about communicating to Nick that he should travel back in time to the Christmas party and make sure to only do the deal later. Like, it... I legitimately don't... It's, the movie really doesn't have very much respect for the audience's intelligence. You look so different. I mean, beautiful. For a senator, I mean... Listen, I'm going to go get another drink. The only reason I appeared in this scene at all is to clearly communicate to Nick that you're with someone else. I have served my purpose. I am disappearing out of the movie. That's her, isn't it? Who? Grace. That's what I'm not living in a state of. Malcolm talks about reading tea leaves. We get some extreme close-ups. To remind me that I could be watching a Sergio Leone movie right now. I mean, the camera cutting between extreme close-ups of, of the faces of the three people, you know, looking back and forth at, at each other in a tense scene. Man, I wish I was watching The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly right now. Another drink, please. 
and then Trevor's girlfriend shows up with the photo just like he asked her to. At this point I have to assume that the movie is trying to tell us Nick can't travel in time without the assistance of alcohol. That has to be the implication. And Julie drives off so Nick of course knows that you know she's going to be in an accident if he doesn't do anything because that's how this movie works and there just happens to be an unlocked car with the keys still in the ignition extremely close by because this movie is entirely built on coincidences and contrivances yes I realize the car is there because it's like I, I don't I forget what it's called like a parking I mean it's not a parking lot parking area or something and yes the you know the the people who drove there in the car are you know basically right next to it and they're still like unloading the car it's still silly like who doesn't take the key out of the ignition like before you step out of the car unless you're gonna like I mean is the idea supposed to be that he's just like a few you know a minute or more you know very little time from getting back in the car and driving it over so it's parked further away from where they're sitting because I'm almost certain that when we see him he's no he looks like he's about settled in yeah it's just and and even without like the fact that he had his back turned when Nick ran up is ridiculously convenient like the scene would have played out completely differently if he had been facing Nick if if he could see Nick running in then Nick wouldn't have been able to get the car and Nick manages to maneuver it so he's the one who dies in the car crash because I guess they felt that there just had to be you know you can't I mean technically it's only the director's cut of the first movie that ends in Evans suicide the theatrical ending suggests that there might be a, a relationship between Evan and Kaylee in in the future I mean yeah I think that's that's why I have some more notes in the in the next section there we go notes taken before watching I right I'm, I'm just very briefly gonna note there's only three memorable quotes for this movie on IMDb and all three of them are bad like I I know movies that aren't much longer than this one that still have considerable like I'm pretty sure a Nightmare on Elm Street 2 isn't much much longer than this one but it has I'm, I'm pretty sure it has way more of, of the uh, yeah and certainly it is a much more like but yeah, that one was theatrically released and is part of a more well-known series. Anyway, so uh, the movie does not really have empathy for the least likable characters. And I think that works fine for it. Other than, you know, I really don't like the characterization of the... The, the the gay or bisexual man as as being this rapist now but I, I will get into that in a little later in this section so yeah this uh, let's see this is the kind of movie that treats some of the women as disposable which is the case with the boss's daughter she's not even in any other scene is she she's there at the restaurant and then they 
and have sex in the bathroom. I mean, she's mentioned when he's, you know, when he sees Julie at the nightclub. But that's, yeah, that's it. She exists. Like, she had to be in the restaurant scene. Because if he just walked into the bathroom and then started having sex with a woman we've never seen before, that would make absolutely no sense. But she's only there. You know, the, the point of her character being in the movie at all was for the bathroom sex scene. And the, yeah. And, and you know, she doesn't get any character traits, just apparently, like, she thinks that the the work part is boring, but she is attracted to him being a good salesman. Oh, actually, I guess that's actually supposed to be, like, in contrast, because not long before that, Julie said, you're always such a salesman, as a negative. Anyway. Um... Yeah, women characterized as not being strong. It's true of this. And, you know, I already mentioned the, the rape scene. I don't think it's inherently wrong for fiction to contain rape and sexual assault. I think it's wrong to include it without exploring the effects of it. You know, that uh, Monster is one of my favorite movies, in part because a lot of that movie is about what... Uh, I guess, is it a spoiler? I'll just... Yeah, I'll just say the, the after effects of, of a rape. Now... That brings us right so from the IMDb goofs section incorrectly regarded as goofs Julie is pregnant at the beginning of the whole story after a whole year she could have had a baby if she were alive and not dead after the accident after next time travel when Julie gets to live there's no mention of the baby however during their argument after Nick got himself fired Julie mentioned I can't forget what we lost in the accident, implying she possibly had a miscarriage due to the crash, hence why there's no baby even after a year. I think that, yeah, that makes sense. And that's, again, like, I think the movie should really explore that. I don't think it's inherently wrong for fictional characters to have abortions or miscarriages, but you have to explore what it does to them. And in real life, I, th I think... There should be, I'm, I'm not sure I think there should be any limitations on abortions. They should, they should be safe, legal, free. Yeah. And, yeah, so the... Huh. I don't know why I copied in I mean a bunch of this didn't I already yeah. maybe anyway quoting some fellow critics why do a sequel with the main character only traveling back to about the beginning of the year or about a couple of years in the past absolutely horrible yeah, I'm almost 100% certain that he never traveled more than a year back. You know, at the end of the movie, they talk about that they met three years before. Actually, I think they have that conversation, that same conversation. Most of that same conversation at the start of the movie as well. But yeah, I, th I think that might have been what the reviewer was mixing up. I'm almost 100% certain. There's never more than one year of, of time traveled. 
Absolutely horrible, the first one was great, but the directors of this film didn't realize what made the first one so great. The first one was great not because of the concept of personal time travel or being able to change events in one person's past, in one's past, but rather because of the heart-wrenching and emotional stories that affected Evan's life. This movie has none of those elements. The film received generally negative reviews, with reviewers criticizing its formulaic copy of the first film simply with different characters. Nick goes back and stops the accident, and he has a pretty good life, but not good enough for Nick. In an attempt to better his life, he starts to mess with the already altered path, and the result and the results end up being tragic. You don't care about Nick. Nick is kind of a jerk who gets what he deserves. It makes it hard to root for any of the characters. The butterfly effect didn't have a lot of visuals, and butterfly effect 2 has even less. The biggest visual in the movie is probably the car wreck at the beginning, but that even that pales compared to other movies who have done similar wrecks. The movie feels more like a low rent version of Final Destination than the previous film. And I can't imagine fans of the first would feel any desire to seek this out. In the original, Ashton Kutcher went through a whole variety of timelines a couple minutes ago, a few years back, and even back to his childhood. Each one resulted in a wide variety of changes and to him and his acquaintances, and you quickly realize that the butterfly effect wasn't something to be toyed with. Here, however, the filmmakers are perfectly content to simply send Nick back in time so he can get a better job so he can do some other trivial little thing. Sure, the obvious event occurs in which he prevents his girlfriend from, from dying, but from there on out, it's simply going back in time for mundane reasons and nothing overly major happens as a result of this. Sure, he goes from being an office drone to a vice president, but other than that, it's the same exact timeline that he had just left. What's the point of that from the audience's perspective? Perhaps the film doesn't use its gimmick as much as it should. It certainly doesn't use it as much as the original movie did. The hero uses his powers like they're a genie in a bottle, instead of truly trying to fix the past to avoid collateral tragedies. Things start going for a loop, then as he ends up... Then, yeah. Meh messed up the rhythm there as he ends up making his current present worse than it was pretty much like the in the original film but whereas the first butterfly movie was wildly over the top dealing with drug addiction child molestation prostitution butterfly effect 2 is rather tame by comparison as the worst we have to deal with is an irate investor who demands his money back i mean to be fair that irate investor does I th did Trevor die from the, or was he being held hostage? I think he was, the idea was that he died from having his head smashed against the, the glass table, which, yeah, I, I could see that. I, I think there's some chance that could, yeah. And, you know, his friend rapes Nick, so it's it's not nothing, but, yeah, it's not... Did they even consider just going to the cops? Ah, I mean, there might be a line in that. Don't. If there is a line in there, feel free to correct me. I, I think there might have been, like Trevor said, we can't go to the police because, or so, something. I think that might have been in there. Because I feel like that would be the obvious, like, what he's doing is illegal. They didn't do anything wrong. You know, it's not like it's a it's a he said she said like Trevor has a bruise on his face. Go to the cops, tell them this bruise on my face comes from this particular person. You know he says that he we we should give him his money back, but he signed a contract saying that you know not yet. I guess it could like it might look bad like if their boss finds out he's going to be mad at them for getting involved with someone like that but they do tell the boss because they ask for the money yeah i think it is a bit of a self own a bit of an own goal that the acting in this movie like 
Nick literally couldn't even tell that his boss was being sarcastic. You know, he's like, okay, so I don't love doing this, but there's this guy who wants his quarter million back. I, how do you, is that okay? You know, and the boss, oh, sure. Uh, you know, grab the checkbook. Uh, and Nick isn't like, okay, look, I'm sorry I'm asking this, but seriously, though, is there anything we can do? No, it says, oh, you're a lifesaver. I, you know, and, and the, it's only when the boss then continues, why don't we give away all the money? And it's just like, the, the yeah, the, per, the delivery of the sarcastic line was so bad that he took it seriously. Eric Lively's timeline flips seem completely uninteresting, all centered around the yawn-inducing questions of whether he gets ahead remains a brow-beaten lackey in his failing startup job, and whether girlfriend Erica Durant decides to move to New York or stay with him. The film suffers from the critical failure of engagement. One just ends up regarding its central character and his problems with a big who cares. The reason why the first movie was very good, I would call it even brilliant, was that for the first half an hour, you didn't know what, what's going on here. You saw Kutcher's childhood, which was from time to time affected by blackouts, and you didn't know why they're there. As this is a sequel, the tension was missing, and the guy didn't even have blackouts at all. Many times during the new movie, I felt like watching the first movie and that the new one just changed a few things. For example, compare the prison scene and the scene on toilets. This movie lacks strong scenes, which are replaced by sex. I can remember the first movie. Dynamite in a box, visit at Lenny's room in hospital, etc. Those moments were breathtaking, quick and strong. What do you have in the second one? I can't believe that professionals can actually create something so bad. Put aside the bland acting and the boring writing for a second, and look at the way the script was structured. The movie was a little less than 90 minutes long, yet nothing even happens for the first 52 minutes, when the movie's more than half over. There's no developing of story or characters whatsoever, a complete waste of 52 minutes of screen time. Whoever wrote this did the equivalent of building a roller coaster, that travels from one side of the park to the other without ever going up, and instead travels across in a completely straight line, and so as you exit off the coaster, you're wondering, WTF was that? The writer of this story forgot to add the one key element that makes all stories work on some level, some conflict for protagonists to overcome, obviously. Nothing resembling drama or suspense took place until either the 52-minute mark or the 61-minute mark. It all depends on whether you would consider his confrontation with a friend in the garage at the 52 minute mark as something significant that builds the story and moves it forward. If not, then there's definitely nothing that happens until the 61 minute mark, which is when he realizes that he's no longer in a relationship with his girlfriend. Now that's actually pretty interesting, but why are we just now getting into the realm of he has to fix this disastrous timeline, he's now in one without his girlfriend? with only less than half an hour of the movie left. What the hell did we watch for the past hour? Everything that happened before was completely inconsequential. You might as well start watching the movie, this movie from the 52 or 61 minute mark. You won't miss a thing. It's very true. Honestly, the very start with the car accident and the last little bit are the only parts that are legitimately somewhat compelling. It feels like the rest of the movie is just treading water, just going through the motions so that it can get to feature length. The first movie, love it or hate it, every single time Evan traveled in time, there was something very clear that he had to fix, like a death or someone having a miserable life. The... Let's see, what was the other thing I wanted to say about that? Ah, crap, it's, I swear, I can, I'm sure I can remember it, that the, right, I think 
if there wasn't pressure to make this a movie, if you made, like, a short film that had, like, the the thing with the car accident. Yeah, like, it's just, if you trimmed this movie down to, to ten minutes or so, and it's just the start with, you know, him getting in the accident, losing her. Then he travels in time, gets her back, but, you know, there's still something wrong so he tries to travel back and yeah he so he decides that she's better off without him so he travels back in time tells her that she tells him that she's pregnant and so he sacrifices himself the way we see in the movie and then it ends you know that might be substantially more compelling you know they basically they didn't have any good ideas like again if you like if you're someone watching this video and you hate the first one, let me know what is your like least favorite of the like what was the worst reason for Evan to travel back in time? What was the most like who cares thing that he had to that he felt he had to change? You know, what was the least cuz I just I personally I'm not saying it's flawless. But I can't really think of any, like, the, yeah, the movie does a really good job. There's always something that he feels responsible for that, you know, either he, you know, sometimes it's because he was, he felt he was too passive. He didn't prevent, you know, something bad from happening. Sometimes he feels that the, uh, uh. What was the other thing? Felt that he was too passive. Felt that... Yeah, yeah, sometimes he, you know, accidentally screwed something up because of trying to fix the, the you know, past, present, and future. Uh, you know, so, yeah, there's... But... Yeah, I, I think I've made my... So yeah, at one point in this movie, you know, the, the, we see that the, that Nick is, you know, receiving oral sex and, you know, basically the idea is that most of the like the movie has zero empathy for him and i'm not saying let's have a lot of empathy for rapists but the the fear of gay or bi or pan men being rapists is hugely overestimated in the minds of homophobes you know basically the the reason that the scene is supposed to make the presumed straight male audience be grossed out because they have you know they're not expected to have empathy for again you know gay or bi or pan men and yeah you know the the scene I think the the rapist himself says that you know he's he's basically he doesn't seem to think that it's rape and he's unapologetic about it but yeah I I think I would definitely say the movie depicts it as a rape and and certainly you know if someone starts having sex with you before you give consent that is rape that is the definition of rape so yeah the movie's depicting a rape, and it plays into this negative and false stereotype that gay, bi, pan men are more likely to rape than straight men. It, uh, and that's, yeah, it's a very harmful stereotype. It leads to real-world harm.
and the IMDb user reviews actually have some homophobia referring to the scene. One or two seem like they don't think that male gay sex can be anything other than rape at all, so... And, and honestly, in 2006, I think a lot of people didn't think that, and I'm sure there's still are, uh, there are still people who think that, but... It was... It was definitely a really... Like, back then, I'm, you know, I, I don't remember very many positive depictions of, of gay people in movies from this time period. Now, the movie, you know, both of, yeah, both this movie and the first one end with the male lead sacrificing himself for the girlfriend and uh let's see there's something yes yeah, so sacrificing his life if we go by the director's cut of the first movie but instead of him like the first movie specifically has the line end like it's it's the movie is explicit in this I suppose that might, I should not use the word explicit when I'm talking about sex, but the movie basically, the director's cut of the first movie, the ending basically tells the audience there will not be any more time traveling, you know, people in this family. His grandfather's dead, his father's dead, and he's dead. His, you know, the, the, ah, what's the word? He had several, you know, he, she, uh, she got pregnant from Jason, Evan's father, multiple times, and she had three stillborns. And the movie seems to imply that the same thing happened with them. They traveled in time and ended up going back and strangling themselves in the womb. And when Evan does it, that, you know, she, she ends up with a different man, and they have kids, and there's, it, it appears that they can't time travel, you know. It was, it was on the male side of his family, there are no more men in his family, you know, that's, I think that was also in part to basically say there aren't going to be any sequels, you know, we're not going to milk this thing. So, of course, someone decided there should be a sequel. And this movie very specifically implies that, I guess I'm call, I'm, I'll call him Nicky, like Julie does. And it's, you know, it's supposed to be a fake out. Oh, you know, car crash, did he still survive somehow? Because she's, you know, she goes into a room and she says, oh, hi, Nick. And, and talks to him about what they're about to do or, you know, keeps it vague enough that we're supposed to not be able to tell that it's a baby and rather rather than him. Honestly, I've known that ending for years. As I mentioned earlier in the video, I watched the Shameful Sequels video back when that was, you know, when that came out. And I remembered it because it's such a ridiculous twist. But, and as far as I understand, the, the next movie doesn't even follow this one. Like, the next movie... I'm not sure acknowledges this movie at all. You know, it's not a it's not a sequel like that. Honestly, I could kind of respect that. Like, I don't think that the third Candyman movie is any good, but I can at least respect they aged up the lead from the or the uh, lead. Yeah, the the there's a girl in the second movie, and she's she's like a small child, and then in the third movie that character is now an adult, you know, so, and, and that helps provide some continuity. And it seems like, I, I feel like they could do that with this, but it doesn't, like, I, I haven't watched it yet, but every review I've read, no, I, I don't think there was a single mention that it's the same 
I guess I could just really quickly check. Let's see. I guess um I'm gonna go with Wikipedia. So I am just really quickly going to go through. Yeah, so the Hmm. Yeah, so let's see. The the third movie Yeah, different characters. Completely different uh, names, which honestly thinking about it, I think that's because they didn't want to have to pay the writer of the second one for reusing his character. But again, it, yeah, it makes it feel less because it's written by, oh, does it not say on Wikipedia who wrote it? Eh. Anyway, the, the, it would provide a little bit of continuity. Anyway, and it is also like, I mean, if the time travel isn't going to be more compatible, I mean, it's, were we supposed to be like, you know what, I actually, yeah. If they make another one, and it's a sequel to this one, like, a baby time traveling, or, uh, I mean, okay, if they made it today, then obviously the kid would be 16, 15, something like that. But, yeah, I could, I could, uh, I think there could be some funny stuff from, like, like, I mean, they got a lot of good stuff out of a, a gigantic baby in... Honey, I Blew Up the Kid, is that what it's called? How'd they manage to make three movies out of, like... <laughs> let's, hey, let's shrink these characters. Oh, hey, let's shrink some more characters. Oh, hey, let's embiggen this other... Yeah. They even, even made a TV show. Wasn't bad. Anyway... Yeah, I, th I think they could have some fun with a time-traveling baby. Now, in this movie, Julie basically exists for Nick to want to be with, you know, f to, to do things for. She doesn't really get a lot of agency. She might as well be a treasured childhood toy of his. And, like, in fact, the one thing she does do on her own, you know, trying to drive away from him, just presents an obstacle, you know, for some something for him to deal with. It's not a choice that she makes that he has to respect. And... I think that was everything. That was everything I had written down. I wanted to briefly, yeah, you know, hypothetically, like, you could rewrite this movie so that instead of her dying in the car accident, like, he's driving the car and he's got, like, let's say it's, uh, I'm spending too much time thinking through the details, just some, some, like, childhood toy, like a race car or something. He's got that in, you know, somewhere in the car. And he gets in the accident, wakes up from a coma. The car was crushed when the car was crushed. And, yeah, you know, he, he wants to go back in time so he can avoid the crash so that he'll still have the car. Like, 
it's not really anything that you know and, and like the when 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 it's revealed that she's with another man the movie basically treats it as oh no he lost her not you know doesn't bother to go into is she happier with this other guy like it, we we know we don't know anything about the other guy other than that he exists you know clearly julie is with some other guy and yeah that it, it's just supposed to make us hope that she'll get back together with Nick, even though by that point we've seen him behave like quite an asshole, you know. So, and I mean, if the movie just had Nick stop and think, wait a second, I did this. I, you know, like in in the in the year that I lost of time. I behaved so badly. I, I mean, did we find out who broke up with who? But anyway, you know, she definitely doesn't want to get back together with him. That's 100% clear. He doesn't stop and think, what What kind of person did I become? That's Because, like, again, like, love it or hate it, and I swear I'm almost done comparing this movie to the first, because the video is almost over, but in the first movie, Evan specifically looks at how his behavior affects his loved ones and he looks at if he's being a good person for them you know it's, it it upsets him when he realizes that he sometimes that that this version of him has behaved like a jerk so yeah so Please go to the comments and let me know what is your favorite time travel movie. Why is it the original Terminator? I'm just kidding. Because it's amazing. So, yeah, you know, if you have ideas, if, if there are things about this movie that you would have done differently, or, you know, if you think the movie's perfect and I am completely full of shit, you're 100%, uh, you know, you can put that if, if that's what you want to put. If you like this video, please comment, thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two or more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested review to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie and one talking about my spoiler thoughts on the most recent video episode of the current Disney Plus MCU show, which these days is Moon Knight. And one talking about my spoiler filled thoughts on the episode of The Mandalorian that I've personally finally gotten around to watching. And recently, the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch my review next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. But I am going to go. I. I I took a selfie before I started watching this movie, so in order to go travel back in time to make sure I never watched it, I'm to go. I'm going to go be sad at the picture. Catch you next time.